All right, let's start reading. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Hey, what's the story on the thing? Did y'all buy the box yet? Oh, so y'all, you've already put all that in there and it's still not working? All right, so y'all think we need to call that guy back? Obviously. Sorry about the technical difficulties. It's not like we're not trying, all right? All right, so anyway, we got Bibles in the back. Amen. We need a Bible, amen? All right, Matthew chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. But to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And now I just wanted to skip down and read one more verse. Verse 20. <clears throat> It says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Father, once again, we just come to you in prayer, Lord, and ask that you give me grace, Lord, that you give me strength or help me to present your word, Lord, for the way that it's written, Lord. You've given us this sermon. This is your first message you ever preached, Lord, that we have record of. Yes. And we pray, Lord God, that your truth, Lord, would unfold out of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So many people call this the, the Sermon on the Mount, or they call it the Beatitudes. And the, the, I titled this morning's message, The Beatitude is Inside, The Attitude is Outside. And the reason I did that is because the word beatitude comes from the Latin beati, and it means to be blessed, to be joyful or fortunate. The word itself is describing a joy or a happiness. Many times the word is translated as happiness, but there's something different about this happiness. It's not something that can be obtained from the outside to make one happy, but it's a happiness or a joy of fulfillment that's, that's, that takes place because of, of on the inside. And it's obvious whenever we look at the, what Jesus was talking about in these particular words that it's describing something that has to do spiritually. Because when you look at the, amen, amen when you look at poor in spirit, those that mourn the meek, that is obvious that that can't be something external that's making someone happy. The Pharisees, and the, and the reason we bring up the Pharisees is because we're going to go back to that verse in verse 20 where Jesus, because that's all part of the context here. But the Pharisees were concerned primarily with external qualities, right? The doing of religion outwardly for a man to be able to see. And what Jesus is talking about is something internal. Before we really even get into the Beatitudes, I want to go back to verses 13 through 16, where Jesus talks about the fact that, that believers are salt and light. It says, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the, the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth, or from that moment moving forward, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. And then he says, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so before we get really started on the Beatitudes, I wanted to talk a little bit about this part because it's all part of the context. These verses that come after his teaching on the Beatitudes, he, he's talking about believers being salt and light. And he used salt and light as an illustration to describe the difference between his people and the world. You know, salt is likened to the believer right here. Salt is likened to the believer and a world without, uh, and a world that is, with, uh, food that is without salt is likened to the world without the believer. Right. right? And light is likened to the believer and a world without that light is likened to, well, a darkened world. Yeah. <clears throat> and ultimately, Jesus is describing the effect that Christians have on the world where they live out their existence, right? And, you know, I was going to ask the question, have you ever cooked before? And, I mean, you know, I'll have to shout at one time. I'm sure most of the women in here have cooked. And I don't know if any of the men in here try to cook. But I've been trying to cook. So now I won't get into why I was trying to cook when I was a teenager. but Because I always was hungry. But we'll just leave it at that. Uh, but whenever, but I, later on, as I got older, I tried to, like, really start cooking. And there was this one particular dish that Miss Angela cooked that I really liked. It was called pasta aglio e olio. All right? And aglio means garlic and olio means oil, olive oil, and so I would try to cook it, man, and I would cook it, and, you know, I found out you're supposed to cook the pasta al dente, it means it's just not mushy, and it's just a little bit chewy, but it's not, it's right there where it's just right where it's supposed to be, so I would practice on getting that pasta just right, and then, you know, you drain the pasta, and you put the oil in there, and then you start adding the garlic, and then you taste it, like, man, that doesn't seem like it has too much garlic in it, I'm going to put a little bit more garlic in there, so I put some more garlic, it's still not right. Put a little bit more garlic. It's still not quite right. Maybe just a little bit more garlic, right? And I can't, we keep adding this garlic, and then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? This stuff over here might need a little bit of salt. That's probably what's going on. Maybe I just need to put a little salt. So I hit it with some salt, tasting it. It's like, whoa! <laughs> you know, I'm like almost coughing. It's like, goodness gracious, how much garlic is this? This is crazy. I'm over here choking on the garlic. Salt did something to that food. I don't know if you've ever noticed it before, but salt enhances the flavor of everything that else is in there. You can cook something with uh, Josh walked out, but Josh, everything Josh cooks at the house, whenever he cooks, has butter. If it doesn't have a stick of butter in it. But one of the things that you'll notice about butter is it's kind of like salt. It makes everything taste better. But you can put make, cook something with salt and lemon and butter and all that in there. I'm sorry, without the salt. Lemon, garlic, butter. And then, and then but, but when you you've tasted it's it's good but but then when you add the salt it's almost like all of a sudden you can taste the lemon the butter the garlic but at the same time they all come together and they form a harmony and it's like a beautiful thing whenever you see what salt does to food so one of the things that I learned about salt is it causes a distinction to the flavors it allows you to be able to see the difference between the flavors now many times people say in this verse that really what the word salt is indicating is that it's a preservative because back in those days they would use salt as a preservative to preserve meat and various things like that and I'm not trying to take away from that fact that salt does preserve right and that the presence of Christians on the earth acts as a preservative for this fallen world but at the same time let me tell you it's talking about its savor the purpose of salt adds savor to food the purpose of salt once again, at least from my experience, brings a distinction between the flavors. Salt in the earth, the Christian in the earth, brings a distinction to the world. It shows a difference between the world and the church or the world and the people of God, right? Same thing that light does. Light does the same thing. Light brings a distinction between light and dark. Right. Uh, you know, that's what salt does. It brings a distinction in food. Light brings a distinction between light and dark. Christians bring a distinction once again between this fallen world. Amen. And and the spiritual light that God brings. He, he went on to say too that other scripture in Matthew 520. I say unto you. That except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. You shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the reason that I bring this verse out is because of the context, the underlying context of what's going on in this particular passage of scripture. So we see Jesus getting up on a mountain and he's beginning to preach a message called the Sermon on the Mount. And we have to try to place ourselves in the lives and pretend that we were one of those 
believers or those disciples that were present at this particular message, right? And what we have to understand is, is that this is the first time that any message like this has really been preached. I mean, at this level. Because what we're, what we're having now is that God's kingdom is coming to earth. Right. One what, of the things that I want to I want to make a point is when I first started studying the Bible in the, in the early years of when I became hungry to study the Bible and very invariably we will read behind other people to see what they have to say. I'm sure that most people have done that and kind of like look something up. Well, what does this person say about that or whatever the case? And it seemed like people were safe, making such a big deal about a distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And when it all comes down to it, I found that there's not really, the, uh, right. they're, they're really one and the same. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are one and the same. And that what we're really talking about here is that God has a kingdom, amen, and that that kingdom has always been and is still today present on the earth today. So the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is still present on the earth today. But when Jesus prays and he says, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because of the fallen condition of this earth, the kingdom of God is not, is not played out exactly the way that it's supposed to be on earth. But one day the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, will be present on earth at the magnitude that it is in heaven, amen, and it will be displayed in that fashion, amen. But God has always had a piece of his kingdom on this earth. When he planted Adam in the garden, that was a piece of his kingdom on this earth. Really and truly at that point, his kingdom was very profound on the earth, right? And from that time of the fall moving forward, we've talked about it many a times, that God has been bringing his kingdom and his presence closer and closer back to mankind, right? And so, but now we have Jesus Amen. who has the kingdom of God resident on the inside of him, present on the mountainside, preaching the first message to those that would be willing to listen and say, saying, hey, God has a kingdom. He's a king, right? God has, God, Jesus is the king. And the king is proclaiming the kingdom of God on the earth today. That's right. And what he's saying in this message is, this is what the citizenry of the kingdom looks like. But whenever you, but what we need to understand is, is that whenever we put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples that are on the mountainside hearing the message, their minds are not thinking the way that our minds are already thinking. They've never seen this Jesus thing before. And they have what their idea of what righteousness is, is connected to the Pharisees. We don't really have time to get into it right now, like to dig real deep. And I've taught on it before, but I want to mention that a lot of change happened to the religion of Israel after the Babylonian captivity. You know, when you go through the book of Kings and you see Isaiah and Jeremiah and even Ezekiel warning the children of Israel that they were to turn, that God sent the prophets to warn because of the kings, how they followed after Solomon, if you'll remember the story, and engaged idolatry. And God would send the prophets and tell them, hey, you got to make things right or else your enemy from the north is going to come in. And we've talked about that multiple times, at least when we first started the church. Assyria took the northern kingdom in 726 B.C. Babylon took the southern kingdom in about 586 BC and that started a long period of time 70 years for the southern kingdom at least of captivity and when that, during that time frame for a much of that time frame the temple was broken down the altar was broken down the sacrifices were stopped <laughs> and because of that the synagogues that we read about in the New Testament started to pop up kind of like churches that are today but the focal point of their worship changed. There was a switch that happened. The switch changed from the focus being on the sacrifice to the teaching of the Torah. There was no longer a sacrifice to look towards as a righteousness gift. Because really, whether they properly saw it or not, that's what it all boiled down to. God gave them the sacrificial system, which was a precursor to Jesus Amen. coming to show them that they were guilty and that the this, this shedding of innocent blood had to be offered up in order for them to be right with God. He was very clear in the Old Testament about what that was all about. For his presence to dwell with them, a sacrifice had to be offered. But with this switch that took place, the focal point came off of that and it came on the teaching of the Torah. 
This is when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to prominence. Because, you know, smart men always got to teach weaker men the right way to do things, right? And that's basically what happened. This, this elite group of so-called smart people began to be formed and they would interpret the scriptures for the people and explain to them what proper righteousness looked like. Now, through the years, what they did was they started adding their own laws and traditions. Matter of fact, if you do like a New Testament survey class, they'll tell you that that by the time Jesus walked on the earth, that the Pharisees and Sadducees had added 600 of their own laws and traditions to the law of Moses. To the point where I've said some of these before, but we see in the law, we don't necessarily look at it that way. But like, for instance, whenever Jesus healed the blind man. And now we've gone through that. We've taught these teachings before, but just to remind you, and I can see real clearly Jesus purposefully broke what their perception of the Sabbath was on purpose Amen. to get a rise Amen. out of them, to Amen. call, to shake them up because their established religion was a false sense of righteousness that the people had been confused by. Whenever he, so what they were mad about, you know, whenever he healed the blind man was that according to the tradition of the Pharisees, they added to the concept that no, no burden should be bared on the Sabbath that whenever he spit into the, and made the clay, he was actually kneading clay and you weren't allowed to knead clay according to them because they would break down what the bearing of a burden was because it wasn't enough that the Lord would say, don't bear a burden on the Sabbath. They had to start getting it into fine detail to describe what actually was bearing a burden and what wasn't bearing a burden. And if you did what they said was right, then now you were following after their righteousness. So you got to understand there's hundreds of years of this going on. Hundreds of years of the traditions of men that are being taught to the people and the people are viewing this so-called external religion of the Pharisees and their mindset says this is what true righteousness looks like. They don't know any better. Just like you and I, if we get caught up in false doctrine, if we get caught up in a false gospel or the traditions of men, which is rampant in the modern church. And we were raised that way and our parents already believed that way when we were born and we're raised that way. The likelihood is, is that that's what we're going to believe. And also that's what our offspring will be trained to believe. And it goes on and on and on. And so that's the condition of what's going on when Jesus does this teaching. And so I find it interesting that after he's done, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. Well, what do you mean, Jesus? How can my righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisee? They do everything right on the outside. It's impossible to try to, because they would never let you see what they were doing wrong on the outside, right? Surely they were doing something wrong on the outside. They were just hiding it when nobody else was looking. Because the spirit of religion can't truly bring right. freedom and victory, right? But I wanted to kind of just set that, that for you to let you see that that's the big difference of what Jesus is talking about. The, religious of the religion of the Pharisees was something that was displayed outwardly. What Jesus is about to talk about is something that takes place inwardly. And because of that internal change that happens is displayed outwardly. Many people even today would preach this wrong. And they would say, this is the way into the kingdom of God. You got to be poor in spirit. You got to be meek in heart. If you're not, then you're not going to make it into the kingdom of God. They're taking into, they're not taking into consideration that this is the first message of the kingdom of God that was ever preached. And that this is a very, you know, one of the things that I've made comments about before is, is that the apostle Paul and really the writings of Peter and John are like commentary on the gospels of Jesus. In other words, Jesus spoke in broader terms. I've used this example a lot. And this is another example where Jesus said that, that unless you first bind the strong man, then you can't spoil the goods. He would, and he, what he was talking about was the strong man was Satan. And that he was coming to bind the strong man. And that, and at least this is the way that I see it. Because what he had done is he had cast a devil out of that person. And they were, caught, they were saying that he was doing the work of Beelzebub. Or he was using the power of the devil. 
And Jesus will say, listen, unless, he says, if I cast out devils by the hand of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that's what happened. Through the hand of God or the power of God, Jesus was casting out devils because the kingdom of God had come upon them. Amen. But, but, but what's happening, though, in, the, in that particular situation, he says, you got to first bind the strong man. Then you can take the spoil of the war. There's a war that's raging on the earth. The spoil of the war that we're talking about is a spiritual war where the souls of men are the spoil that, 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 that's being engaged, that's being fought for. And Jesus said, I've come to bind the strong man. But what we don't understand based just upon what Jesus said is how does that work for me? Yet the apostle Paul comes along and he explains that because of what Jesus did at the cross, there was a transference, right? He took our guilt. He gave us his righteousness. The standing of righteousness gives us access to grace. Amen. His grace is the power of the Holy Spirit yes. moving and operating Amen. in our lives. The power of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the power of a, of a horde of demons. Amen. 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 And, that, and that the power of God is now can be resident on the inside of the believer. Amen. To be utilized. To be, to be the, the, in other words, the enemy, the straw man is bound According to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, when we look on the rest of this earth and we see what's going on, it doesn't look like the strong man is bound. But according to the word of God for the believer that's operating and believing in faith, the Holy Spirit moving and operating in his life, he is given the power. Amen. And he sees the strong man bound amen. in his life and in these particular uh, situations. Now, one more thing before we get in to... Uh, to the actual Beatitudes. I want you to take another look at verse 1. Matthew 5 verse 1. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Two, two words that kind of stuck out to me right there. Uh, multitudes and disciples. There, there's a difference between the two, Right? It says, so there were many that thronged and followed after him. We see stories time and again when in, in the narratives of the gospel where there was a huge crowd. But the crowd and the mixed multitude even is not the same as the disciples. Some people would argue the point that this is talking about the 12 disciples. I don't believe that. Most of the scholars I read behind don't believe that. Disciples... And that, the, the, the 12 were the closest to him. Then there was a 70, right? And then there were even more than that. Disciples were, once again, the word means a learner of Christ. Those that were true followers of him. Those that really wanted to hear what it was and to learn what it was that he was saying. Not those that were just on the fringes wanting to get what they could get to satisfy themselves. You remember whenever he turned to the fish, he fed them with the fish and the loaves. And then he went over to the other side and then they came and they followed him over to the other side. The first thing he said to them is, you don't seek me because you saw the miracles. Said, well, what do you mean they didn't see it? Of course they saw it. Not only did they see it, they experienced it. No, the idea was, is that you saw them with proper perception. So the proper perception is, is that they reveal to you who I truly am. Amen. But instead, you seek to have your belly filled. Right. The idea is, is that you're looking for something that's going to please you, something that's going to satisfy you, something external that's going to fulfill you. But, it, but it, that's not what I'm coming to bring. Right. What I'm coming to bring is something that's going to change you yes. on the inside. Oh, yeah. Amen. And so that's what ends up happening. He, when he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountainside. Then the disciples came. So there's a lot of people that are saying that they're following him. There's a lot of people that are saying that they're Christians. But the reality of it is, is that they're part of the multitude and they're not really disciples. See, the disciples going to go ahead and go the extra mile, at least to hear what is it that he's really saying. A, ser a searcher, a seeker of the truth, right? And, and so there they are. There's a very few that will follow up the hill to hear what he has to say. And even furthermore... When they hear what he has to say, that are going to be receptive towards what they hear. The reason that I say that is because the words or the instruction that Jesus gives is the opposite of what right. the world and religion would say. That's good. <laughs> the world is good. The world doesn't want to hear it at all. Number one, that's how I know I'm saved <laughs> because the things that I used to love, I don't love no more. Yeah. And the world does not want to hear the instruction of the words of Jesus. Amen. 
right? And religion doesn't want to hear it either. Amen. Because religion, self-righteousness wants to elevate self. And the words of what Jesus speaks is saying something completely opposite. Because it's really speaking from his heart of who he really was. To lower self. To we I can't remember how many times I've said it out of Philippians chapter 3. Let the, where the apostle Paul tells the church of Philippi. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, didn't consider it something to be grasped or held on to. But he humbled himself. He lowered himself. Took upon the form of a man, the form of a servant, so that he could die even the death of the cross. It's a humility, a, a heart of servanthood that's willing to serve at the Father's will in order to bring the better good of what God the Father has planned for the human race. And so that's what I would say again, is that these words that Jesus speaks are opposite of what the world wants and they're opposite of what religion would look for. So let's look again at... Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. We'll start with uh, Well, before we get into that, I guess I wanted to also use the word, say one more time about the word blessed. Beatty from the Latin. <clears throat> It, that's where the word beatitude comes from. It was used synonymously with joy, but it was a joy that transcended something external, right? And that it was something internal. Nothing on this earth could bring you the kind of joy that what Jesus did. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Ain't no man on earth can bring this kind of joy to a woman. Ain't no woman on earth can bring this kind of joy to a man. Ain't no brand new house that you live in with all the crown molding that can bring you this kind of joy. And even the smell of a new car, not that I know too much about that, but even the smell of a new car can't bring you this kind of joy. You can keep on looking for it in that. I wouldn't mind having the smell of a new car one time, but I, I've never owned a new car. But guess what? I know for a fact that even if I ever own a new car, it ain't going to bring me the kind of joy of what Jesus is talking about on this mountainside. It's going to maybe put a dent in my pocket every month, but it's not going to bring me the kind of joy of what Jesus is talking about, right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here we go again. Talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. This is the type of, so the beatitude is something on the inside. The attitude is something that is exhibited outwardly. How do you see yourself? That's his point number one. Poor in spirit. How do you see yourself? Can you fix it or do you need him? Poor in spirit. All right. The word itself describes a poverty stricken beggar. A person that can't do anything for himself and couldn't accomplish anything without the help of another. Now I can assure you that God doesn't want us walking around in the physical like a poverty stricken be beggar. I can tell you that he doesn't want that. How do I know? Because the word of God has scriptures that counter that contradict that. And the word of God is not contradictory to itself, although some unknown, and I don't mean to be mean, ignorant people would think so, that the word yeah. of God is contradictory. No, it's not. The word of God is balanced. Amen. Yeah. It, gives you, it, it gives you a balance of alternating views sometimes. And guess what? What he's trying to say is, is that the truth lies in between. Because he also says that he that doesn't work and provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. So he doesn't want you on the street corner begging for money from other people physically. Right. And with Jesus uh, also, whenever he saw the condition of how religion was treating the people, what did he do? He I mean, I mentioned that, imagine this in my mind. He sat down on a chair. And the Bible says that while all this stuff was going on, he was just slowly making that whip. You remember that? I mean, I was thinking to myself when I really got a hold of that, he just there he sat. And he was just braiding this thing together until he exploded in a righteous anger and he purged the temple. Right. So what I'm trying to say is, is that Jesus took action is what I'm trying to say. But what I will say is this. No, the poor in spirit is speaking of the spirit of the man. It describes a proper estimation of oneself and realizes that left to himself without the intervention of God, he would be a physical beggar. He would be a physical beggar and he realizes that he can't change himself and that he can't give victory to himself. And he must have the help of God or he won't Amen. make it. Amen.
poor in spirit? Do you have the right estimation of yourself? Because the truth be told, each and every one of us, to some extent, we probably have some pride issues. That's right. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe maybe not everybody. Mm-hmm. Maybe some people's self-esteem is so broken down and beaten down that, that they don't have any pride at all. Right? But either way, it, neither one is God's will. God wants to lift us up. Amen. God wants to lift us up and strengthen us. And he wants to give us the victory that we need in the midst of our life. But many times people have an overestimation of themselves. They have an overestimation of their skills. They have an overestimation of what God, of how they, they perform in what it is that they're doing. And the Lord wants to reveal to us and show us really that without him, we can't do it. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people that are truly gifted. There's a lot of people that can get a lot done on their own. And that's the world. And and many of those people will be very successful in the world. But the true child of God has to come to the realization, the proper estimation of himself, that when it comes to the things of God, he can't accomplish it in his own strength. He has to be poor in spirit. And he has to understand, like a spiritual beggar, that he needs the help of the Lord. And listen, when we can come to the place of humility, and realize, I can't do that. I can't, I can't get that done in my own strength. I'm telling you, when that burden is lifted and you realize that you don't have to take every, def- you don't have to defend yourself in every situation, right? Mm-hmm. And that you can truly release those things to the Lord and say, God, I need you to take care of this. There's a great joy connected Amen. to that. There's a great liberate. Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. Has anybody ever experienced that in your life Amen. at least one time? That you know, there, there got to be one time that you, that you, that through the grace of God you did it the right way, right? That you were in the midst of a situation and you were so frustrated because you couldn't change it, and that what, but but that the Lord put it on your heart and He said, just give it to me. Amen. And it's not like you never tried to give it to Him before. But but it's one of those things that whenever he allows you to truly release it, you can't you feel the spiritual, the the burden lifted? Amen. Amen. That he lifts it. And so to be poor in spirit is to understand, Lord, I got to partner with you because I I can't get this done. Amen. Amen. All right. Second thing comes out of verse four where it says, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. So number two is, how do we see our sin? Number one is, how do we see ourselves? Number two is, how do we see our sin? Blessed are they that mourn. The word means to grieve someone that is dead. When you mourn something in the context of this word, it's to grieve something that is dead. The one thing that God grieves over is sin. There's no question about that. We can try to skate around it. We can try to act like it's not there. But the reality of it is, is that if there's one thing on this fallen earth that God, that grieves God, it is sin. Sin caused separation between him and his prized creation. Sin caused the death of his only begotten son. And sin still sends countless millions to an eternal hell. Sin grieves God. He mourns over the effect that it has on human lives. And he wants us to mourn over our sin also. In other words, the idea of this beatitude is, is that do you mourn over what God mourns for? Yeah. It's not about what you're mourning over. Yeah. It's about what God mourns over. Or what did we say? The word confession, man. I wrote it up on the board of last week, I think. Homologia. Say the same thing. God mourns over this, then we should mourn over this. Whenever Jesus wept, I've said this a million times, but whenever Jesus finally shows up to the funeral service, And he sees the condition of the people. The Bible says Jesus wept. Well, we already determined that Jesus already knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So the reason Jesus is weeping is not just because of the loss of his friend. He loved Lazarus, but he knew in about 35 minutes, I'm about to call him from the dead because this is an illustration of the fact that I'm about to go to Jerusalem and be hung on the cross. So that's not what Jesus is weeping over. Jesus is weeping over the pain and the grieving and the mourning of what humanity feels. And all of this, however we want to slice it, is connected to sin. Sin causes death. The reason they were grieving and mourning was because of the death that was connected. God mourns sin and God wants his people of his kingdom, the citizenry of his kingdom, to also mourn over sin. The good news is that there's comfort to those that mourn. The listeners 
that were at this message on that day, they didn't understand it quite yet. Later on, Jesus will explain it much better, more clearly in John towards the end of his ministry. That, there's, that he was going to pray to the Father and the Father was going to send another comforter. And in the Greek language, it's parakletos. Para means side. Kletos is another word for called. Called alongside to help. Jesus said, I'm going to pray to the Father. He's going to send another comforter. The, the Holy Spirit. So whenever those that are mourning, Matthew chapter 5, talking about those that mourn shall be comforted. Whenever we mourn over our sin and we, and we confess the same thing, God, we know you mourn over sin. We mourn over our sin. We need some help down here. The comforter comes alongside to help. <clears throat> Amen. To help in the midst of that situation and that circumstance that we could not. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us victory over the power of sin. It's the place that every Christian should be, a place where he stops enjoying his sin and instead starts mourning his sin. And when he does, the comforter, because of Calvary, yeah. that's why the comforter can work. Amen. You, people that say, oh, there's more to the cross, it's the Holy Spirit, and I'm not trying to pick on it anymore, I've given it, I've given it, that's all in the past. They just don't understand what they're saying. The Holy Spirit works in unison through the work of what Jesus did. Without the cross and the exchange that took place and us being given his righteousness in order to have access to his grace and to his presence, then the Holy Spirit cannot operate and perform and bring comfort to our lives and in our situations because we're still guilty, separated and at enmity with God. But because of the cross, because of faith in Calvary and what Jesus did and the right standing with God, now the Holy Spirit can be our comfort. So when we agree with God and his, uh, his, what he says about sin, the Holy Spirit can be our comforter and help us in those situations. Matthew chapter 5 verse 5. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. How we approach life in this world. How we approach life in this world. The reason I say that is because look what it says. They shall inherit the earth. It's talking about people that, behave, that are exhibiting life a certain way on the earth today. Are going to experience something on the earth different tomorrow. They're going to inherit the earth. It said meekness. Have you ever heard anybody say this before? Meekness isn't weakness. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I've heard that a million times. Yeah. Meekness isn't weakness. And I, and I never really understood what they were saying because sometimes the people that would say it kind of irritated me. Like, I think that they were partially taking I mean, there was some truth to what they were saying, but, but I knew that there was something wrong. Something wasn't quite right with, the, with what they meant by it. Because they, they, they were kind of like the kind of people that would want their own day in court, you know? The yeah, they're the attitude. Yeah, exactly. They, they kind of like, you know, they, they, they were too ready to take a stand for themselves. But there's some truth to it, too, because meekness doesn't mean that you're weak and you just let people walk all over you, right? There is a stand that God would have us to take, at least for his kingdom. Amen. Meekness isn't weakness, and in reality, the word itself, it, it describes a controlled power. One of the things that I see in Jesus' ministry, and I didn't really put the, I didn't even look the scripture up, but if it's in the Gospel of John, it's when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he asks Peter and them to pray, and Judas comes with the temple guard and also with some, with some soldiers from Rome, and shows up, and, he, and when Jesus' back is turned to him, and he says, whom do you seek? And they say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And in the Greek language, he doesn't say, I am he. He says, ego, he am my, meaning I am, which is the same words that were used whenever Moses saw the burning bush. And when he says, I am, all of a sudden it says they all fell out under the power of God. Amen. <laughs> At the same time, he allows them to take him. I felt the Holy Spirit on that one too, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, he allows them to take him, to bind him, to slap him, to blindfold him, to pluck his beard out. And he willingly humbles himself and goes to the cross and dies. Meekness is controlled power. This word was used to describe stallions that had been broken, a power that was under control. 
I, I spoke recently about how vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and how so often we want to get our own vengeance for ourselves. But those that will rule with God then, they shall inherit the earth, must understand who God is today. He gives us power for the purpose of using us for his glory, his way. That's right. As I was reading that particular definition about a stallion that's broken, I swear, I, my mind immediately flashed back to like 2002 or 2003, something like that, when the Lord was really getting a hold of me. And I was just right, I was right now so much stuff that the Lord was putting on my heart, man. And I didn't really understand the message of the cross that great yet. But I mean, I'm telling you, God was just flooding my mind with not only scriptures, but concepts. And that this was one that I could literally see it. Like I was laying on this altar right here studying and I could literally see the words written on the paper. I remember the notebook it was written in. And this is what I wrote. A stallion is of no use to its master until it is broken. Until a stallion, is, it looks pretty. I mean, it's powerful. You can see its muscles glistening in the sun, throwing its head back and, 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 and bucking and rearing and all that kind of stuff inside of that little fence. But it ain't no use to its master. Can't do nothing with it. But once it's broken, its power can be harnessed. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is power that's under control, under the control of God. And whenever God's people allow themselves to be broken, allow themselves to be to be harnessed by God. Now he can allow his power to strengthen them. Amen. So that his will on earth can be done today. Romans chapter eight, verses 17 through 23 talks about the fact that on this earth today, there's things that we experience and we go through tragedy, turmoil, pain, hurt today. But the apostle Paul said, I'm convinced the stuff, the things that we experience today are going to pale and come. Don't don't even stress about what you feel today, because guess what? Tomorrow we're going to be heirs with the Lord. We're going to be co-heirs with Christ. And that's what he says. He said, if children and heirs, this is Romans 8, 17, if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Jesus suffered on this earth because the world was against him. And you can bet that if you take a stand for the Lord, there's going to be times of persecution and suffering in your own life. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. What does that mean? It means that the whole world is waiting for the final redemption of us, the people of God. I'm telling you, look, the birds are singing for the day that he's returning. It, you, the, the, the tree longs for the day when it's no longer going to decay. The, the grass longs for the day when it's no longer going to wither. The grass longs for the day when it never, no longer has to grow next to the thistle and the thorn. That's part of the curse. The creation groans, waiting for the finality of the sons of men. Because man fell, the earth that was created to inhabit him also fell. But there's coming a day when God's going to make it all right. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. It says, for the creature, that's the, talking about the whole creation, was made subject to vanity. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subject, subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Amen. If you're born again, that's Ephesians 1.13, you were given the earnest of the Spirit. Holy Spirit came to live inside of your heart. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. In other words, that when you first got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you, that was just a down payment that revealed to you how real God was, but that there's a hope for a future day. Hallelujah. When this is not the final completion of what God has planned for us. In the meantime, we're to go through the turmoil. We're to go through the suffering. We're to go through the frustrations. We're to go through the persecutions. Amen. Understanding and knowing that the meekness, hallelujah, of the child of God is empowered by the power of God. God. He will be with us every step of the way. Yes. But there's hope for tomorrow. Listen, God, the Apostle Paul said, if this is all we got to live for, then we are pitiful. Now, the word in the King James is pitiable. This is a pitiable situation. And this is all we're living for today. 
You know, they used to say, and I've said it before too, so I'm not picking on anybody. Don't get mad at me if you watch it on video. They used to, I used to say this, and people say it a lot. Well, even if it's not real, I lived a good life. No, the Apostle Paul said, pitiable. If this is all we have to look forward to, pitiable. He said, because if, if there's not more to this, then we just soon eat and drink and call it a day. That's what he said. But he was convinced. He was convinced that it was real because he had an earnest, a down payment of the spirit, and it drove him on. He said, i got to apprehend that which I've been apprehended by. Even though I might sit in this Roman prison in misery, chained up, dirty, nasty, cold, and wet. Bring the blankets, Timothy. Bring, bring, my, bring my, uh, my, my overcoat, Timothy, along with the scroll so I can read in this dark dungeon before they cut my head off. I got a hope on the inside of me that tells me that there's something bigger to the picture here. The prosperity gospel won't work in the bottom of the Mamertine prison in Rome. Amen. You can't get your Rolls Royce, Paul, and just drive out of there. No. Truth be told, sometimes on this earth it doesn't feel good. But there's more that lies ahead. Hallelujah. 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 The joy of the Lord. Amen. 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 He says in verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. In this one here, I put our position towards his truth. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, righteousness, we all know, at least in this church, we should know by now, it describes our standing before God. When a person is truly hungry or thirsty for the righteousness that God speaks of, then they search for it. I always use Scott Rowe as an example. I mean, Robert remembers him. He used to come to the Bible study. Captain Scott, he'd come, he visited a couple times, but he lives in Georgia. And I, I talked to him the other day. I don't remember why he called me, but he did. And we talked a little bit. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I even brought it up to him because I remember that one time, and this doesn't have anything to do with me as the, as the preacher. I'm just telling you this is an example because I feel weird saying it if you take it the wrong way. After he and I talked, I just met him. Somebody introduced me to him. I think it was Thomas. Thomas introduced me to him. They lived in the same little apartment right there. And we were talking. And I was talking to him about the message of the cross, what true righteousness was, about the liberty and the freedom that comes through Calvary. And all of a sudden, he stopped dead in his tracks. He said, dude, I've been praying for this. I, I have literally prayed night and day that the Lord would re lead me to someone that could tell me the truth about the gospel because I knew that what I was being told what and he said just right now I know that when you just said what you said the Holy Spirit showed me in my heart that you you or at least what you're saying is an answer to that prayer that I was looking for what the point that I'm trying to make to that is is that a person that's truly seeking after the righteousness of God will seek it like a man in a desert that's hungry and thirsty for water and his body dry him forward until he finds until he can't walk no more yeah. literally can't crawl one more foot till he falls face first in the sand because he can't move anymore that's what a person that's seeking after true righteousness what is the righteousness of God seeking for it looking for it because you know what he knows especially the child of God he knows when he hadn't found it right, there's a lot of counterfeits out there mm -hmm. a lot of imposters whether it be Mormonism or Jehovah Witnesses or whatever you want to call it. A lot of imposters that can provide something else that can be a counterfeit, like pyrite. You know, it's a fool's gold thing. It provides a counterfeit, whether it be a fellowship, having other people around you coming to you. See, that'd be a hard thing for me because, I mean, I love all of y'all, but I don't really like people that much. That ain't going to fix me. I just, just, I just assume I don't need that. I don't really want that. I mean, I want to hang out with people and talk to people. But you get the point that I'm trying to make. I don't want people to try to make me feel better. Sometimes they just add stress to me. Amen. You know, but, but I'm just being real. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is some people are longing for that. And I get it. They're, they're longing for that. And that, that's an imposter that fills a void. That's not true righteousness. True righteousness does something on the inside. You can still be all alone, even in a Mamertine prison, all by yourself. Amen. And the righteousness of God is settled into your heart. Amen. Because what we learned is, is that righteousness is a gift from God. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
Righteousness of God is a gift from God to the world. The Father gave us his son, Jesus, and the righteousness of God is a gift given by Jesus to mankind. That's what it says in Romans 5, 17, the gift of righteousness, the exchange that took place on Calvary. And that gift allows a flow of grace, and that grace allows a victory in the life. And when that victory is experienced, the soul says, right now on the field. Let's look at uh, Romans, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 7, and then we're going to also read 9 and 10. We're almost done here. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let's also look at verses 9 and 10. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In this one here, I put our attitudes towards others. Mercy and peace, right? Mercy. Many, many have said that mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve to get. You ever heard that before? Mercy is when we don't get what we deserve to get. Grace is when we just, when God gives us something, well, we definitely didn't deserve it. So mercy is when we didn't get what we were supposed to get. Grace is when he gave us something that we didn't deserve, right? The English definition said it like this. Compassionate or kindly forbearance shown towards an, an offender. Forbearance means the holding back of. God held back from giving us what was due us. The wages of sin is death. He allowed the wrath, his wrath, to be placed on Jesus so that his mercy could be given to us. Amen. Amen. So blessed are those that are merciful. The peacemaker, one who has received the peace of God and allows that peace to flow out of him and into others. That, that's really what a peacemaker is. He's now a receiver of the peace of God, and now that peace on the inside of him can flow out of him into other people. That's what a peacemaker is. Romans 5, 1, we talk about that all the time, says you've been justified by faith, therefore you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace in the world is not the same as what peace in God's mind. As a matter of fact, John 14, 26 through 27, I can tell you that it's not the same peace because Jesus said it. Jesus said, but the comforter, who's that? The Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm going to leave peace with you, but it's not the same kind of peace that the world gives and is looking for. Look, Trump can try, his cabinet can try, they can even move the capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and I commend them for doing that, but none of that is going to be the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about. Amen. Peace also doesn't mean that we go along with whatever everybody wants us to go along with. As a matter of fact, our separation and our distinction like salt and light yeah. causes a natural separation. Right. Homosexuality is wrong according to the word of God. And you will never get me to say that it's not. If that's what you require of me to say in order for me to be a peacemaker in your eyes, then I will never be a peacemaker in your eyes. Amen. At the same time, I don't want to have anything to do with the dude that has pictures. You can Google him. He goes and he preaches at the Decadence Festival. He gets up on a ladder. He's got signs that says, God hates fads. I don't want to have nothing to do with that because that's not a peacemaker. That's not the spirit of God. Jesus died for homosexuals just like he died for Matt. Matt's sin that he was saved from is no different or worse than the homosexual. Yes, it's an abomination of God in the guise of God because it's, it's separate from creation. God caused man to be able to procreate like Lord Larson says. If you're on an island with a whole bunch of homosexuals, in order for that civilization to continue to live, somebody's going to have to swim. It's not going to happen. It's not the way that God intended it to be. Amen. It's contrary to his creation. It don't make no sense to the life. If you really stop and you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not saying that there are Listen to me. Sometimes we try to figure things out logically and scientifically. And the reality of it is that we're forgetting the spirituality. That's right. There's demon spirits connected to homosexuality Amen. just as there is to fornication and just as there is to doing drugs and addictions. Amen. Demon spirits will drive you towards something that you ain't supposed to have. But the presence of God, amen, is, has given us peace. Amen. 
See, therefore, if you're a homosexual that is an enmity and lacking peace with God, the peace in me wants to flow to you, right? The peace in me doesn't want to like, do, write the sign, like I said. Instead, I want to tell you that God loves you. God loves you. Listen, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will, will tweak your words, too. I can remember the first time I went to Bourbon Street with Lance Rao to preach the gospel as he was holding that cross. And I can just remember, like, and I still do it today when I go in the street. There's a part to me that wants to tell them how much God loves them. Uh, and at first, there was a couple of people that passed by. And I was like, man, God loves you so much, dude. You just don't understand. And, you know, they keep walking. And, I, and all I was getting out was how much God loved them. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was like, you ain't telling them the whole story, boy. You better tighten up. God loves you. It's the next one that came by. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your sin. Just as he sent your, his son to die for my sin. I always put myself in the same boat. I don't care how. You can, no, you know, I, need to I don't care how gay they look. When I talk to gay people, I'm talking about, I always tell them, listen, God sent his son to die for your sin. Just as he had to send his son to die for my sin. Amen. He loves you that much. He loves me that much. That's what a peacemaker is. I'm trying to make peace between you and God. You might not want that peace. You, that may not be the peace that you're looking for, but that's what a peacemaker is in the eyes of God. Amen. One that allows the Holy Spirit that brings peace, hallelujah, through the cross between man and God to flow out of one into another. Amen. This is the story of Christianity from the beginning. I got to tell you that none of this has changed. Look at John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I promise we're almost done. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The point that I'm trying to make is that peacemaker. The kind of peacemaker that God is looking for has been the story of Christianity for the last 2,000 years. This is how the gospel has moved forward. This is what the apostle John, the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's what he called himself. He says, that which was from the beginning. He's talking about Jesus, the word that spoke the world into existence, which we have heard. The apostle John saying, I heard him preaching on this mountainside. <laughs> Which we have seen with our eyes. I saw with my eyes. In the Greek the idea is, is that we heard him to the effect that the sound is still ringing in our ears. We saw him to the effect that it's still burned on the retina of our mind. We can still see him. This, this impact that this gospel message has had on us. We have looked upon our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you the eternal life. These want to be a peacemaker. John the Beloved is one to be a peacemaker and share what is in him with others. Amen. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father. That's why we tell you all this. That's why we tell you about this one that we heard. Why we tell you about this one that we saw. Why we tell you about this one that we walked with and that we handled and that we touched. So that you could have joint participation. That's what the word fellowship means in the Greek. Koinonia. Joint participation with him. With us. Fellowship as a body of believers that you could be made at peace with God. And that you could also be a peacemaker. Now I got to tell you. That sometimes peacemakers experience hostility. That's right. right? He says in verses 11 of Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now you see how you got to take balance in the scriptures and how easily somebody can say, Oh, God's called me to be a peacemaker. Mm. You know, oh, I'm not called to speak against that mm. particular thing. God's called me to be a peacemaker. Well, then, then the gospel is obviously contradicting itself. It could have contradicted itself that fast to where, to where Jesus is going to say you're supposed to be a peacemaker. And then two verses later, he's going to say that people are going to revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. No, the reality of it is, is this, is that God has a definition of peace. And it's not the same as what the world says. Right. It's not the same as what, we, as what the world is expecting to receive. 